You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hey, y'all. This is Marie from the Culture Cult Travel Show, a slightly, not definitely, an appropriate comedy podcast where I and a guest tell you crazy history stories you've probably never heard of from all 197 countries. So if you also love a good and dirty educational show, then definitely check out the Culture Cult Travel Show. But I know you're here for Queen's podcast, and that involves Katie and Nathan covering history with some cocktails and some cuss words. So if you don't like it, you can get the f*** out. I'm just kidding. Uh, actually, I don't care what you do. Uh, just letting you know that they're going to cuss, and you can't be mad because we warned you. Hi, this is Katie. And this is Nathan. And you're listening to Queen's Podcast, the show about badass women in history. <laughs> Hello, Nathan. Hey, Katie. I am so excited about this episode today. This was a really, really cool, fun one to research. Uh, Patreon supporter Kyle, if you don't know, we are letting our top tier Patreon supporters pick the topics this season. And And I love this one. Great job, Kyle. Like this one was at first I started, I was like, okay, I can get this into one episode. And then no, then I started researching. (laughs) And then we fell down 700 rabbit holes. And oh, I know. And this it's so fascinating to go into Eastern culture, spoiler alert. Yeah, but going into Eastern culture, it's so easy to fall down rabbit hole after rabbit hole, because it's just not something we're used to seeing, right? Yeah. We're not used to seeing this type of social construct and how everything's organized over there is completely different. So it is so easy to just get lost like the NBC I hit know. series. Thank you, listener Kyle, for suggesting. Who did he suggest, Nathan? Empress Sichi. Yes. Oh. But tell us who she was. Yeah, Empress Sichi was Empress Dowager of the 19th century China. So there's a lot of debate in history if, you know, like Glinda of Wizard of Oz says, are you a good witch or are you a bad witch? If she was a (laughs) a cool lady or a shady lady university graduate, she was blamed Uh for murders and being greedy and killing a lot of people and just being... Yeah, she's a divisive character. Some people say that she's gone down in history as a bad guy unfairly, and some people say she deserved it. You know, if you've ever listened to Queen's podcast, you know we are, there's always more to the story than surface yes. levels. Yeah. But before we dive into her life and times, Nathan, tell us about this cocktail. So this is quite possibly at the top of my list of cocktails. Ooh. One of my favorite, hands down. So what I did is I took a shot and a half of rum, okay. a half a shot of orange liqueur like Grand Marnier mm-hmm. or whatever you, your favorite orange liqueur is, and then a s- squeeze of about a half of a lime, and mm-hmm. then you top that all off with about a third of a cup of watermelon juice. <gasps> Ooh. And if if you're feeling, because the name of the drink is called the Chinese Firecracker. Okay. If you're feeling a little spicy, you can put a pinch of cayenne pepper in there, but I opted against that because my heartburn would say otherwise. (laughs) So I just kept it nice, simple, and clean. And this is such a beautiful cocktail because not only is the color just gorgeous because it's this nice little pink, pink color there. It is so tasty, so refreshing. Doesn't even feel like you're drinking any alcohol. Dangerous, so drink cautiously. But guys, this is at the top of the list. So if you've never made one of the drinks before, make this one. It's delicious. Love it. And we need to get on making that cocktail cookbook. So yeah, let's get in to our girl, Sichi. Nathan, take us, get us started. Yes. So Sichi was born on November 29th of 1835. So instead of giving you Western astrology realness, (laughs) We're going to go straight for Chinese astrology because that's where our girl's from. Yes. So she was born in the year of the goat, which means they have very delicate thoughts, strong creativity, perseverance. They acquire professional skills very well. Although they look gentle on the surface, they're tough on the inside, always insisting on their own opinions in their minds. And they have this strong inner resilience and excellent defensive instincts spoiler Ooh. alert this describes her to a t <laughs> love it what we are the ox right i don't really know yes. anything about chinese astrology i should get into it okay so she wasn't born with the name Sichi. 
In China, it's fairly, it's really common for people from noble families to be given one name at birth, and it'll change with their status. We saw that with Empress Wu as well. We saw that, we've seen it a lot of times in this show. But like we do every time, we're just going to call her Sichi throughout the entire episode just to avoid confusion, because I think her name changes like six times. <laughs> Yeah, it changed a ton of times. So it's like, mm, let's just continuity purposes. Yes, so exactly. You guys are like, oh, that's who they're talking yeah, about. Yeah. <laughs> China was being run by the Manchurians at this point. And it had kind of been this way for almost 200 years. Mm -hmm. uh, the Manchurian rule had been great, but it was kind of on the way out. And when I say great with the <laughs> question mark, it, it was, um, it was also elitist. Kind of very. Kind of Racist. Yes. Racist. Just yes. straight up racist, well, guys. Interesting, because the Manchurians were the minority. And, yes. But they were they, like 1% of the population. And they, but they were the 1% because they were running everything and they were very elitist and clicky. Yes. And if you were of Manchurian descent, you're automatically considered a noble badass. Okay. <laughs> and everyone could have their own tradition. They allow you to have your traditions, your belief systems. They don't bother you. But... If they weren't Manchurian traditions, then they just weren't good enough. Yeah. You can't right. sit with us. <laughs> <laughs> and the Manchurian rule was not, yeah, it was kind of on its way out. Like you were saying, when Sichi was a kid, they were also going, China was going through the first of two opium wars when Sichi was a kid. Mm. So let's set the scene for the Westerners not being super great in this story. Shocker. Shocker. Uh so surprising. <laughs> <laughs> so we all know the Brits love their freaking tea. And they are just hard up for that tasty stewed brown water. <laughs> and China has some tasty stewed brown water. And not only that, they have a variety of it. So Britain's like, hey, girl, China, you are looking good over there with that sweet, sweet brown tea water. Uh, <laughs> let's trade. I'll give you what you want and we can like trade for tea. And China's like, you don't really have anything that we want. Like, why are you so obsessed with me? Back off. And Britain's yeah. like, um, hey, baby girl. I think I got something you might like. May I introduce you to opium? <laughs> And that's how Britain got China to be his drug-addicted girlfriend. Um, and as with any type of relationship, this was toxic. You know and Hugh you Britney toxic? Spears. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hence why this is called the Opium Wars. <laughs> so there's all that. But let's talk a little bit more about our girl. Yeah. And less about the culture and the current events at the time. Right. If there's anything we need to know about Sichi is... That she's smart. Yeah. Like, she wouldn't have been sent far away with some fancy education like all the Western nobles would. <laughs> in fact, learning to read and write in her native language is a whole thing. Yeah. In case you missed it, Chinese is one of the more difficult languages to learn. And back then, it was like, yeah, like, it was just really, really complicated. And it just wasn't common for everyone to know how to read and write. Yeah, each word has a symbol, and if with a stroke of a pen, you could make pen into penis real quick. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's, okay. It's a bad example. <laughs> we couldn't leave a Queen's Podcast episode without a dick joke. I mean, there's going to be more, probably. I don't know. Let's see what happens. <laughs> but reading and writing in Imperial Chinese was very, very complicated, and only the most educated people could do this. And by educated, of course, we mean she got that money, girl. She yeah. rich, bitch. <laughs> um, because regardless of culture, rich people love to gatekeep education. It's true. Si Chi would write and read in Chinese, which was super rare for a girl. And she picked it up from her father. And she was basically her dad's little right hand man, woman, girl, right hand girl. That might be important later. Yep. Her dad was a member of the Border Blue Banner. Say that three times yeah. fast. It's this incredibly complicated nobility system that we... Another rabbit hole that you just don't have time go for. down into. Just don't have time to. for. <laughs> um, this banner was lower in ranks of nobility, but we're still pretty respected. So mm -hmm. it wouldn't have been unheard of for dudes of this rank to educate their daughters, but it seems like dad really went that extra mile when he realized that Sichi was really the most clever of all of his kids. Yeah, and of course I'm going to make an Anne Boleyn comparison because that's just my entire brand. But I, <laughs> it reminded me, because Sichi had a brother, and Anne Boleyn 
had a brother, but the boy wasn't the one that Anne Boleyn's dad sent to go live with and be educated at a French court. He realized early on that, oh, my daughter's the one that's special. My daughter's the one that we need to elevate. And that's what Sichi's dad did as well. Uh, yeah, just saw early on as... I think he even said she's almost as good as having a smart son or something like that, which is like (laughs) meant to be nice, but meant to be a compliment. But it's also kind of like, oh, okay, dad. (laughs) Yeah. Ouch. Yeah. So while she was never given a formal education, she was recognized from a young age as as being street smart. Yeah. And like a lot of Chinese families during the Opium Wars, they were struggling financially. And Sichi went to work to help out her family. And no, she... She wasn't selling opium on the corner to bring her family money. It wasn't that kind of gig. She was doing something so much more. She was doing ooh, fashion. Yes. Yes. Turn to the left. Turn to the left. Yes. I love this. Our girl was making that coin as a seamstress. She was getting that money, sewing dresses, designing clothes. And she was really talented, which we love this for her. And she took on a lot of jobs, sewing and designing, and she basically kind of single-handedly gets her family out of debt. So... Okay, girl. Okay, girl. Yes. (laughs) You can really tell that dad valued her because she's an adolescent and she's already helping her dad balance the books. Yeah. She's 12 (laughs) and she's her dad's financial advisor. (laughs) Like... Hey, that <laughs> yeah. that's going to that'll come in handy one day, you know? Yeah, whenever you're learning to run a household, I don't know, maybe maybe mm. this has something to do with what's going to happen in her future. Yeah. Okay, let's switch gears and clark. that was clark, me switching clark, gears. And fast forward <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> okay, so now our girl is 16. So she's getting up there in age. She's 16. Yeah, she's practically geriatric. And she's single? Come on. So, What's wrong with her? yeah, <laughs> and, but the <laughs> emperor needs a new consort and some of his some ladies to fill out his, for lack of a better term, his harem. Her family is like, ooh, see, she might be a good candidate. So let's get her out there. Yeah. And now what we're going to talk about is kind of like a hodgepodge of practices that we've discussed in other episodes. Mm-hmm. Again, this is one of those rabbit holes that you could probably spend a whole episode on yeah. in and of itself. Mm-hmm. But like Empress Wu, who is the only other Chinese that we've covered, Chinese woman that we've covered, the emperor would have had his main wife, like consort. Yeah. But then he'd also have women that lived in his quote-unquote harem more or less which we saw in roxelena roxelena foxy Um, roxelena yes (laughs) no thank god unlike roxelena we don't think any of the women were like kidnapped and forced Forced (laughs) into the harem what a what a horror story but yeah so the emperor at this time held one of those bride shows that we've seen yeah. in Russian episodes before, where all the noble families from all over China would bring their daughters to more or less compete to be chosen to be one of the emperor's either concubines or consort. Yep. So let's meet the emperor real quick. All right. His name is Sheng Feng. And he's only about five years older than Zichi, which, whew, thank God. Thank God. God, do you remember in the Empress Wu one where she was like the first king that she was a concubine to was like older than her dad? That it could have been a lot grosser. But Sheng Feng hadn't he hadn't really had an easy go as emperor. Mm-mm. He'd only been emperor for about a year or two at this point, and already he's just stressed the fuck out. He'd inherited a bit of what scholars call a turd sandwich. When, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, scholarly yeah. official term. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Within his short time of being king so far, he'd already had two major revolts, like uprisings. Like we've mentioned, the just things, there's the opium wars, there's no one's got any money. It's just, it's he's he's dealing with a lot. It's hard out here for a pimp. It it's hard. is. It's hard out here for an emperor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, back to the bride party. So Sheng Feng's not necessarily looking for boning material. I mean, he could find that if he wanted it because he's got this whole laundry list of concubines. Yeah. And these concubines are all ranked? Like, <laughs> generals? Like, concubine Danglin Wang reporting for duty. <laughs> <Dang> um, <laughs> 
there's another dick joke. Um, <laughs> it, anyway, it's this elaborate tiering system for all the king's ladies. It's almost kind of like a caste system within mm-hmm. the harem. Yeah. When they were chosen, all the ladies would stay in their own little like places within the palace because they would stay in close proximity and they're all kind of fighting for the emperor's attention or they could be. So things could get kind of icky if um, they weren't managed correctly. So um, think like a bad girls club (laughs) meets sister wives meets big brother (laughs) or the bachelorette or something like that. You know, like if things weren't run correctly, it was like drama for your mama and maybe might end in some a little bit of murder well empress Wu is the yeah. primary culprit of that like yeah she she committed murder to move up through the ranks so when the emperor is looking for an empress he's looking for a woman to run that whole harem that whole household mm-hmm. she doesn't need to be a stone cold fox but she still needs to be bone a bull yeah for the emperor but most of all she needs to have her wits she needs to know how to manage a household full of women people need to like her yes yes and she needs to be like miss congeniality basically Mm -hmm. yeah exactly yeah yeah just needs to be a smart lady so at that bride show there are 60 ladies auditioning to enlist in this weird sex army and (laughs) most of the women are sent home i think only 11 progress to the Mm -hmm. next round and Sichi was one of them so hey that's pretty cool yeah now the emperor hadn't chosen an empress he chose a handful of women to join the harem and then from there he's going to pick an empress after he sees all of them in action yeah so <clears throat> Zichi is put in the sixth tier of concubines and she is thrilled at this honor because it would have been a huge deal for her family yeah she's like Fuck yeah, I got a golden ticket. I, I got a golden ticket. ticket. <laughs> so that golden ticket gets her to the Forbidden City. Ooh. And she gets to stay in the concubine quarters, which BT does. Yeah, that's I, I linked a, a link yeah. photo of it, but it's gorgeous. Yeah. Gorgeous def- place. I can definitely put that link to in the show notes. Yeah, it's um fancy as fuck. And Zichi is charming she's witty she's making friends she's playing all these really good social games with everybody getting in everybody's favor so she's really succeeding uh just a little side note i didn't know i'd never heard of the forbidden i've never heard it referred to the forbidden city in beijing before so i was like what is that so i went down a little bit of a rabbit hole it's basically this cluster of palaces in beijing with a huge wall around it and it's got in there a bunch of palaces it has the palaces have 10,000 rooms in them. It's got like parks Holy and um, it's just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. It was built in the 1400s. So at this point, it's already been the main place for the the king to live for 400 years. And it's called the Forbidden City because of how guarded it is and how impossible it is to get into. Because a lot of times we talk about these women from these noble families that spend a lot of time going to court growing up. She would have never been here before this is her first time in the forbidden city so i have to wonder if she was nervous to move there because she'd only ever lived with her parents before you know yeah but no worries no worries she's making friends y'all friends uh (laughs) enter another concubine who was also recently selected sian Mm -hmm. and they seemed to hit it off from the get-go they're both kind of very similar level-headed smart bitches who get shit done and here at queen's podcast we love that for them we love we love smart bitches that get shit done and this friendship of theirs lasted throughout their lifetime which is which is great yeah they're you know maybe there's like an alternative story where they run away together and (laughs) i would have loved that so what's also nice is that sichi's new buddy has caught the eye of the emperor and Cian is moving on up to the Forbidden City. <laughs> <laughs> and she's bringing Sichi with her. So Cian is made empress and it pays to have friends in high places because two years later, Sichi is promoted to the fifth rank of concubine. And now when the emperor is wanting to bone, if Cian isn't into it, guess who's getting those, hey, you up texts. Um, that's 
Sichi. Yes. She's getting those messages from the king because her her bestie is literally yeah. empress. So her bestie trusts her and knows mm-hmm. that she's not going to undermine her. Exactly. So she's always directing the empress towards her. There or are the emperor towards emperor, her. Sorry. Yeah. Or the empress. We don't know what. what oh. <laughs> I want to write like an alternative history where it's a romance with Cian and Sichi, but I don't know. Oh, that would have been beautiful. I know. So there's there's conflicting stories about her time with the emperor. The emperor. Some say that uh, the emperor heard Sichi singing and kind of fell in love with her. There's also stories that she had like these stunning eyes that he was just kind of like hypnotized by. There's also stories about her very early on trying to give him political advice and him wanting to have her executed. Have you heard that one? No. (laughs) So yeah, so the story goes that she was giving him political advice because, I mean, she's used to advising her dad and stuff, and he was just not into it. So he actually was going to have her executed for meddling. And uh, C.A.N. was like, hey, let's not, maybe that's an overreaction. And goes to Sichi and is like, cut that shit out. And (laughs) Cian saves Sichi's life because the emperor was going to have her executed for talking too much. Big sexy mouth. (laughs) Again, we're having Anne Boleyn crossover series. Yeah. (laughs) We know that she wasn't his favorite concubine, but it does seem like, by all accounts, she lived a happy life at the Forbidden City. She had her best friend. She was moving up in the ranks. Everything's going great for her. And we think that she was honestly genuinely happy at this point. Yeah. And she was even happier when a year after getting promoted, she gets pregnant. She's preggers. Yes. The emperor had a few daughters at this time, but it was like actually this entire ordeal that he didn't have any sons. Since girls can't run countries because uteruses, uh, Bagadix. Sichi uh, knows that if she has a boy, she's going to get even another promotion. And guess what? Yes! It's a boy! Baby boy, you've been on my mind. Fill, my, fill my regency. Fill my regency. Um, <laughs> once her baby boy reached one years old, she's elevated up so high in the ranking that she literally only answers to one person. And that's right. That's her bestie. Part of me wonders, why did they wait a whole year for her to move up after she had a boy? Maybe it was like... But it's this bureaucracy concubine thing, or maybe they want to make sure the boy survives. That's that was my sure. that was my initial thought is that they probably wanted to make sure the boy survived before they because I don't know I don't know that you could necessarily get demoted you know I don't know if they could mm-hmm. give her the promotion and then if the boy dies take it back so yeah I think they were waiting yeah. to see if it like survived infancy you know what she is in a happy spot she's got her son she's got a promotion she's got her bestie let's go ahead. And take a break while she is riding high, and then we can come back and hear the rest of her story. Yeah. And we are back. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about the emperor. So let's. he liked to um, overindulge, as they usually do. Yep. Um, he was quite the slut. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he was quite the partier as well. Drugs. Alcohol, 24-7, partying like a rock star, even though rock and roll wasn't invented. No, no. (laughs) And look, we are pro-slut here. Who cares? Yes. Your body, your choice. But, you know, when you've got a whole country to run, you should probably consider uh, taking care of yourself. (laughs) Yeah, as someone who lived through college days on a steady diet of... uh, of, well, I actually really didn't do that many drugs in college. That's kind of I did. you. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> just isn't sustainable. I bet he had the best hangover cures. He had all the Gatorade and ramen, but yeah. Yeah, but, like if you haven't had ramen after a long night out and you're hungover, what are oh you doing God. with your life? Or pho. Pho or ramen. Either one yeah. is going to maybe not cure your hangover, but certainly not hurt anything. But Yes. Uh, yes. But needless to say, all the ramen in the world couldn't cure this emperor's hangovers. And uh, we talked earlier about how this rain wasn't a peaceful one. And so he would hit the bottle pretty hard when he was stressed. And he's stressed all the fucking time. So his liver is just like, help. (laughs) (laughs) But 
He had done permanent damage to his health, which had never been great to start off with. Yeah. He now walked with a limp and couldn't read and write anymore. And he's not even 30 yet. Yeah. So I think this, th- think some of this was pre-drugs and booze. I think like, he probably just had health issues that were extremely agitated by all the drugs and alcohol. Yeah. But that's when Sichi's like, oh, you need help reading and writing? Guess what I know how to do? Uh. Uh, after all, her son with him was now the heir apparent. He was going to be emperor one day. So he starts trusting her more and not so much asking for her advice with stuff, but letting her help with things like reading and writing and administration. Yeah. So quick, quick, quick rabbit hole. For those of you that aren't familiar with Eastern royal lineages, it's a little different than Western cultures. The next emperor didn't have to be directly descended from the emperor and empress. That's right. what we're used to. Right. The emperor merely had to have a son with any of his concubines. And the empress, kind of like what they did in Rome, they would mm-hmm. just adopt the child and be like, and now you're mine. Yeah. We kind of went over that like in the Roxelena episode, but it was like... But then it was like, and then all the sons kill each other and the one yeah. still living. Luckily, he didn't have any other sons. But like, luckily, yeah. I don't think that was so much the vibe here. But uh, Yeah. Where where was this when Henry VIII was around? Like, Well, I mean, it was oh. yeah, it, it was happening, just not in England. <laughs> like, yeah. True. How true, much easier true. if he could have just named one of his illegitimate sons. Like, yeah. Anyway. Anyway. Yeah. The Empress would simply just raise the child as her own. And this could have been really bad for Sichi as the biological mother usually wasn't part of that. Mm-hmm. You know, since Cian was her best friend, she still got to be a part of her son's life. Love this for her. Yeah, she got to raise her child, which isn't very common. Yeah. <clears throat> it's not a given. But let's dig ourselves out of that rabbit out hole. Of that one. <laughs> yeah, because our girl Sichi is working right alongside the emperor, helping him carry out official court business since obviously he can't read. She's helping to keep him in the loop. All the while, she's slowly learning how to run China, which I have to imagine she's like, finally, I can use my brain again. Yeah. Just my uterus. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's pretty fucking cool. Again, this would have been rare for women to be able to read and write in Chinese. And so then they were never part of the administration, never part of running shit. She's writing on the emperor's behalf. So she's clued in to what's going on with the military. She's like maybe writing official court documents and correspondence. On top of getting to use her brain again, she knows the tea. Yes. She is in the fucking loop with everything going on. And... Talking military isn't a small thing at this time because China was like smack dab in the middle of another opium war. The the sequel. (laughs) Opium War. Part two. (laughs) Yes. That's right. Britain got China hooked on drugs again. Okay. Um, So so needless to say, Sichi is very skeptical of the West. I would be too. Can you blame her? I can't really blame her. No, no. Okay. So in 1860, the second opium war was coming to an end. And England sent over a diplomatic envoy. More or less, it was like, let's make an agreement to end this war. But Shang Feng was like, fuck that. And he had this group of diplomats tortured and executed, which was just like not a chill move. But he was just so fucking sick of the Brits coming over there. And also maybe he was drunk. And wasn't yeah, really probably. Thinking probably. about what he was doing. <clears throat> and the Brits were like, what in the actual fuck? So... The Brits turn around and burn down a palace or a place called the Old Summer Palace, which was a beautiful place that had huge cultural significance to them. It was it was much more than just a house. It was a big middle finger to China. And the emperor took this very personally. Yes, he was devastated. The Old Summer Palace, it took it burned for three days. Holy moly. Yeah. The ruins are still there. They've never built over it. It's just ruins still there now. But uh, yeah, so the emperor was devastated. And Sichi and her son fled from Beijing because it's kind of like, what are the Brits going to do next? Are they going to come for us? They weren't, but I I don't blame them for getting the fuck out of town. And can can you imagine how horrified she probably was? Oh, oh my gosh. Fear. Meanwhile, the emperor is living in fear as well. So what does he do? He hits the bottle hard and really starts getting trashed on all the drugs and booze he can get his hands on which isn't 
great because he's got dementia <laughs> and he's like 30. He's only um, 30 <laughs> with dementia. So yeah, I just, it would be interesting if, uh, I don't know, if we could figure out what was going on with him because I feel like it's more, I, I kind of wonder if maybe he had a stroke. Mm. That's my, I'm Dr. Katie awesome. here. Uh, Dr. Katie. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Yeah, so he the emperor's on his deathbed at age thirty. He's dying of dementia and stuff. He he has to name a successor, and he summons in his two main ladies, Sichi and Cian, and they go to his room and he hands them these seals. So these seals are really really important. They represent that you are writing in the emperor's hand. So if you have one of these seals, whatever you write, you sign it with this, you stamp it with the seal. It's it's viewed as coming straight from the emperor. This seemed to make sense since Sichi was already helping him write everything anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, she had already been doing this and it's a big deal that they have these seals. It's a big deal to have a seal. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Because the emperor was basically saying, hey, when I die, you two need to work together to raise our kid and to raise China, basically. Yeah. <laughs> the two women both have official documentation that they are literally writing on behalf of the emperor moving forward. Right. And then he summons his eight of his closest advisors, uh, and he names them the eight regent ministers. And they were going to work together to act as regent on behalf of the five-year-old emperor, because babies don't need jobs. Babies don't need jobs. Uh, eight incompetent men, two close-knit, intelligent women, with the power to write on behalf of the emperor. I mean, what could, what go, could wrong? go wrong? <laughs> Why don't we take a quick break and then we can discuss what could go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and we are back. And sadly, the emperor is dead. And now, Sichi's five-year-old son is the new emperor. Um, emperor Tongji. Uh, if we are butchering these names, I swear, we looked them up. We're trying, okay? but uh, We're trying real hard. We're trying real hard. But Tong Shi is, yeah, he's five. Remember, her bestie, Cian, is legally his mom. And so they are working together to gain control over his regency. Yeah, and this is around the time that Sichi is actually given the name Sichi. Uh, Cian had her raised to dowager empress status along with herself. Yeah. Because... Who doesn't love a good promotion if you can't promote yourself? Right. Um, and she now called herself Empress Cian, and her co-dowager was Sichi. So Empress Cian meant the Queen of the East, and Sichi meant the Queen of the West. The more you know. Uh, I think it's because like they stayed in. She stayed in the east side of the palace, and Sichi stayed in the west side of the palace. So. Very simple. Yeah. <laughs> In case you've never listened to an episode of Queen's Podcast, when there's a Regency Council of Noble Dumbasses against the powerful Mother... It's time for a coup, y'all. Coup! <laughs> Specifically, the Zinyu coup. Zinyu coup, yeah. <laughs> there's some debate on how much power the dying emperor gave these two women. So, like whenever he, was he gave them the them, seals, yeah. Yeah, whenever he was giving them the seals, was this just a gift to be like... Thank you so much for all of this. Here's the two seals. Or did he actually want them to have power? So coffee talk. Coffee talk. Was it a was it a present to keep for the emperor, or, or, or did he intend for them to use it? Discuss. I don't think he intended them to. I think it was symbolic. I think it was yeah. like you are the mothers of the next uh, emperor. I think it was symbolic. I think it was like hold on to these until the until he's older. I do not think he meant for these women to be in power. and But they were like, a loophole! So what do you think? <laughs> I think I think that he wanted them to have some power mm -hmm. because the emperor, babies don't need jobs. Babies and don't need jobs. we've seen this over and over and over in the West where babies don't need jobs. So you give mom a little more power because she... But he didn't make, he didn't put them in the Regency Council. No, he didn't. So, You're right. You're right. I don't know. But I think it might have just been symbolic. But do you think our girls took it as symbolic? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. They're like, if, if they <laughs> yeah. if they would have, this episode probably wouldn't be two two yeah. episodes long. Yeah. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Either way, these eight regents are a shit show. They they all have their own issues. Um, they're fighting a lot. 
I just a lot of b- buffoonery with these buffoonery guys. Buffoonery and tomfoolery. Yes, they couldn't <laughs> agree on anything that some of them are partying and sleeping around and just don't really seem to be on the same page. So yeah, it's just a bit of a hot mess. Hot mess express. Yeah. One of the eight regions, the dude named Shun, was particularly troublesome. Yeah. He was kind of like outwardly talking about being the only regent, and mm-hmm. people thought he might actually have plans to overthrow the young emperor and become emperor himself. So eh, we don't really trust that guy. We don't trust this guy. No, no, no. Sichi and Sian were like, we have to do something. These guys are like running the shit to the ground. So we're in the middle of a war. We don't have time for this infighting and for all your partying. So they took charge. Behind the scenes, Sichi is wheeling and dealing. She's whispering in court, finding people who don't like these eight regents. And honestly, she doesn't have to look that far. Mm -mm. Um, (laughs) Which should tell you that she's not this evil, shrewd woman that we all think of. It's just a bunch of incompetent men trying to run the country. Or maybe it's both. Yeah. Maybe it's both. Now, Sichi was a lot better at hiding her disdain to the regents than Sian was. Like, sometimes they'd have, like, meetings that they're all supposed to attend together, and Sian would straight up just not go. (laughs) Sichi would be left to kind of, like, fend for herself in that one. But maybe they also just agreed that, hey, I'm better at I'm better at this than you. Why don't you just stay out of it? But, uh, yeah, she would sometimes be the sole representative amongst the regents. Yeah. Now, let's meet a new character. Okay. Prince Gong. Um, Prince Gong had been left out of politics because he was viewed as being a little too sympathetic towards the West. I, yeah. I don't... I don't know. I went back and forth on this. I don't think he necessarily sympathized with the West that much. It was just that he was an instrumental part in signing the treaty that ended the second opium wars yeah and this treaty was called the unequal treaty (laughs) because it gave the west way too much power like uh, we we've seen it britain owned hong kong yeah yeah and that was one of the things that they leased hong kong to britain because of this so it was like what this isn't This isn't a treaty. This is just straight up Britain being like, okay, now we own this. It was unequal. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. Uh, Yeah, and Gong was pretty instrumental in coming to that. I don't know. Uh, Yeah. The the, the political view of him was he signed the treaty. Therefore, he sympathizes with the West because it was so hardcore Western. Pro-West, yeah. 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 So it's like, is that his fault? No. Shun got word that Sichi and Prince Gong were starting to be buddies. And he was like, I don't like that one bit. Mm-hmm. And he told Sichi, you need to give me your royal seals. And she was like, uh, you need to fucking suck my dick, dude. Like, absolutely not. <laughs> Direct quote. <laughs> Direct quote in first Sichi. Oh, Sichi probably had the biggest dick of them all. Oh, too. my God. Love it. Big Love clit it. energy here. And so Shun actually cut off food from being delivered to, like, her part of the palace. Uh, to try to starve her out? I don't know. But she's like, no, I, you're not getting this seal. Sorry. Sorry about it, bro. Okay, so the old emperor had been dead for a while, but they were waiting for a sign to actually bury him. And I guess that sign had finally come. So the regents are getting ready to be part of the funeral. They're getting the funeral arrangements. But Sichi and Sian are staying at home. Yeah. And Prince Gong sees, he's like, this is, this is the time to strike. And he slides into her DMs and is like, you up? And she's Mm -hmm. like, I know where this is going. Say less. Let's put the plan into motion. An official court document just plops into her lap one day. She's just sitting there. It's like, oh, look at this. Ah, What is it? It, it's just like, what, what What could this be? It was a document with the old emperor's seal on it, supposedly written while on his deathbed. Right. And it said that the late emperor wanted Sichi to, quote unquote, rule behind the curtains until her son grows up. And it also states that Prince Gong should join the court and aid the emperor as well. And it hmm. also says that Shun is a garbage person. <laughs> who forced everyone to flee when the old summer palace was burnt down and thus was a traitor. 
how convenient that they just found this document that the emperor this... wrote on his deathbed. <laughs> I don't know, just what? How did this happen? <laughs> like, this again gives me Empress Wu vibes. Yeah. With the ruling behind the curtain. Mm-hmm. Like, the woman wasn't able to make decisions, but she would just sit, literally, sit behind a curtain. Behind the curtain, yeah. <laughs> and tell the king or emperor, hey, you should do this. Hey, you should do that. And he yep. would listen. Yep. But... All of this had the late emperor's seal on it. So legally, it does come from him. I mean, real talk. Zichi and Gong wrote this themselves. 1,000%. 1,000%. But, but that doesn't matter. Kind of irrelevant. Yeah, because yeah. it's an official court document. So what are you going to yep. do about it? But now, Zichi has the saying that, you know, she's like, I'm the true leader. So she drafts up a court document that states that the eight regents are all douchebags and um, they can now fuck off forever. And that is a direct quote from the document. (laughs) Yeah. Shun gets word of what's happening and hightails it back to court, but there's nothing he can do to save himself. The eight regents are basically enemies to the state now. So Shun is arrested and executed. Um, They had his head cut off at a public vegetable garden. Yeah, this was a big deal. That's not vegan friendly. Uh -uh. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely not vegan friendly. This was a big deal because, you know, um, he was nobility and he was being executed as the way that they executed like common thieves, you know. So it was sending a message of like, fuck around and find out, please. I dare you, Mm -hmm. you know. Now, Prince Gong had wanted Shun to be executed in this, like, really gruesome manner. And we're not going to go into details because torture's gross. Um, Not a fan. Yeah, it's gross, but it it was called slow slicing or death by a million cuts. I feel like we've covered that before. Death by a million, have we? I I feel like somebody has had a death by a million cuts, which ah, sounds awful. It's like, Um, yeah, (laughs) maybe I blocked it out because... (laughs) traumatic yeah um yeah no thank you no, i don't want that thank for you me. so she sichi was viewed as being merciful because she was like okay prince gong take a seat, take a seat. we're not going to torture Calm this down. guy we're just going to have him beheaded simple plain jane done yes and so it was seen as this like merciful act of her not wanting to torture someone yes um and then she ordered two of the other dudes from the regency to take their own lives so that was also seen as a mercy because nobody was tortured and they were allowed to just do that at home with their family and like not be this public thing. Um, it's very, it's very Roman. Like it again, is, I'm getting, I'm they, getting Roman vibes where it's like they corner you in a room and they're like, all right, you're going to commit suicide. It's like, you're going to you're... suicide if you force me to do it. Yeah. No, it's murder. It's murder. <laughs> it's still murder. Yeah. Cause that's what, that's what happened with Messalina, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think what they did in this instance is they basically handed them a bunch of bed sheets and were like, I don't know, maybe you could hang yourself. Maybe you hang yourself right now. Yeah. And they're like, oh, okay. Not really. It wasn't a question. Here you go. Yeah. (laughs) But no, I mean, she's, yeah, she's showing that don't start no shit. There won't be no shit. And then the other five regent dudes were allowed to like live i i don't know if they went to exile their title yeah, yeah but, but like they didn't have the same power but she didn't kill them so, so she was shown she was trying to like get some look how merciful and nice i am <laughs> so now it's 1861 and zichi is 26 guys how intelligent girl boss smart yes like she's 26 (laughs) years old and she is now the de facto ruler of china yeah she looks around and she's like "Ooh, girl this shit shit is messy messy (laughs) messalina we got some cleaning up to do and you know what i think that's where we're gonna leave her that's a good place to leave her all right well come back in a couple weeks for the second episode cheers bitches cheers